No, I didn't order any room service. No, Come no, on, sir. No, get no, look, get it open. Get fine. it open. We want to see your bike. Oh, all right. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, not you again. It's so cool to be part of the first world championship of the sport. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty gnarly, dude. <laughs> like the start is, start literally just goes straight up this fucking climb. <laughs> 800 meters of climbing, yeah? Well, over the whole race, yeah. which is not like, to, to be honest, um, but it just feels a little bit like it's been catered to people that actually aren't gravel riders. Um, you know, like people are coming from the world tour that have literally never ridden a gravel bike before. And had they done that, like the Belgian waffle ride or or uh, Unbound or Iceland Rift, like they wouldn't have made it 20Ks. Their bikes would have exploded. Like it's not representative of the sport. I think it's a pretty disappointing thing to think that the first course could actually be won, something. One by you, a roadie. Well, not, I mean, I don't care if it's one by a roadie, right? Like, Strongest person on the day. That's that's great. But the fact that it might be one on a road bike, like that's insane. Oh yeah. <laughs> Get ready for the bang. Oh yeah. Is that the noise? Is that the good noise, that's my man? That's good noise. That's a good smoke. Most important thing in a gravel race is like getting back into the group as soon as you can after a flat because like it's not if, it's when you flat. So it's like, you know, if you have a hole in your tire, you firstly you find it, you grab your dyna plug and you just literally smash it into the hole. Don't mess around with anything else, I think. This is not a sponsored plug. I'm not sponsored by dyna plug, but they are 100% the absolute best product for this stuff. Yeah, like learn, Learn how to do basic mechanical stuff, like you know, beating tubeless tires, putting in uh, rim liners, which is another thing that I love a lot. These things, yeah. The difference that this makes, like this, is really something that's come across from mountain biking, um, and it's kind of where gravel is cool because it kind of integrates technologies from both road and mountain bike. The risk is with lower pressure is you might actually just like smash your rim and explode it, which is like totally possible to happen on, on any wheel. But when you've got this, it just absolutely eliminates it. It's like a it's like a run flat tire and I actually did a World Cup in Poland. I was sitting second overall and I double flatted with like 6k to go and I just rode the double flat to the end with these in and I actually still managed to get fourth. So it was like, instead of just getting off the bike and walking it in thinking like game over, I could still finish so like get rim liners it's like a huge advantage that like revolutionizes your bike that only cost 20 bucks how about sealant how often you're replacing your sealant mate well actually hold on, i can show you real quick hold the phone <laughs> so you see these things sealant asteroids <laughs> do you ever feel like a whoop in your bike like where the bike's like you can't really make sense of why it's feeling like a little bit like movie. I can guarantee you've probably got one of these in your tire. So it's either way you've had like a small gash in the tire or some airs come in, the sealant hardens. And uh, a lot of people think that the sealant in their tire, but always just open up your tire and check what's in it and top up if you need to, because it takes, it takes five minutes to top up sealant and it takes an hour to walk home. So with it being your first year gravel racing, first yep. year out of the Pro Tour, how has it changed your relationship to riding? Oh, I mean, it's, it's a completely different thing, but at the same time not. Like, I, I feel sad when I speak to, to ex-professional riders when I ask them, you know, have you ridden your bike lately? And they're like, why would I do that? Yeah. You know, I, I, got my, I got my... I can eat instead. I can sit at home and eat and drink yeah but it's you know a, a lot of them will pick up other sports because they're still they're still addicted to exercising but 
it's like a very, very unhealthy relationship to cycling because of, you know, whatever their relationship was to it as a professional. But I think there's like a key difference between the people that keep riding after their professional career on the road and those that don't is it really comes down to why did they get into professional cycling and for me I never got into professional cycling as the end goal dream it was actually just something that you know happened from born from a passion whereas I think a lot of people um, that I've noticed anyway come into uh, you know professional cycling as a dream that they had from 13 or 14 and it's just something that's been so indoctrinated into their life that at the end of the day there's no balance and um, you know, for me, by the end of my career, it was starting to feel like the the push from it all was just getting to be a little bit too much. And as soon as I jumped onto the gravel bike, it was like I had the love and the balance back. So, you know, for me, the best thing about the gravel bike is I just, I feel totally in love with bikes again. The, the, the oldest part of me has always been a mountain biker. Um, and then, you know, I did quite a few years doing the World Cup scene. Uh, which was really fun, but it was also around the, the financial crisis, so there was like no teams, no money, so in my mind I'd actually quit cycling in 2009, well quit the, the trying to be a cyclist in 2009, and then um, I just got a few little opportunities with friends to go do some road racing and it turned out I was much better at that than I was on the cross country bike. How, how do you feel about a world and how do you feel about um... Yeah, the UCI getting in on the, the gravel scene, making it kind of very... Well, it's not, it's not an American course, is it? That's for sure. Well, I mean, we keep trying to define gravel as, like, one thing. Yeah. Gravel is lots of things. And there's... Some of the American races are the most boring things you've ever done in terms of a course. Like, you know, Steamboat had basically no challenges, but what made it amazing and epic was how hard we raced and the fact that it's at altitude and it's in a beautiful place and the organizer's fantastic. And, but then you've got races like the Belgian Waffle Ride, North Carolina, which is like, it's psychopathic. Like it's basically mountain biking. And then you've got 5,000 meters climbing in a, 2000, uh, in a 200 kilometer course. So, um, you know, compare that to here, which is like, we're on, essentially we're on like farmer's flat paths here. I like, I think 50% asphalt and 700 meters climbing over 200 kilometers it's like you know it's it's incomparable from a course perspective um but also you know like the the vibe at these other races it's like you know they're literally handing you a beer as you finish um whereas here we're chasing a rainbow jersey which is which is kind of cool right like i think it's fantastic and um and i can see why all of these you know world tour guys have jumped across because you know why not you know, if you've got the engine, maybe you've got the skills. I think it's pretty cool, but um, there, there is something that's at least a little bit fishy about how the whole thing sort of come together and how, uh, you know, riders haven't had to do any gravel races to actually qualify. Yeah. And then sadly, um, you know, some of the national federations have actually not taken the world's biggest gravel riders to the races, but they've taken their world tour pros instead which, um, you know, for me, I think uh, there's a real point to be made that gravel is its own sport. Are we representing gravel as its own sport or are we just trying to pump it up as much as we can so that you know, media outlets and these places can get as many hits and everything as they can? Or are we actually trying to support gravel? And I think it's a little bit disappointing that, you know, a, a guy like Mattia De Marchi, who's the, the biggest rider in Italy on gravel, undisputably, so undisputedly, <laughs> he's, um, he didn't get a start in the elite race and they took mountain bikers, cyclocross riders and road cyclists, professional road cyclists instead of him. And, you know, if you ask anyone in the gravel world who's the best European gravel rider, there's only one name that ever comes up. And it's, uh, you know, for me, there's, there's just like a small disappointing factor in that we had these UCI World Cup series um, and it turned out you could only qualify for your age category, not the elite race. So we've been racing around all year qualifying for Worlds and having this like super focus on our own competition. And then next thing, no one's actually guaranteed a spot in the elite race. So it's, 
it is a little bit funny, but it's the first one, so you know they're, they're going to iron out a lot of things. And I think this is sort of the prototype for the sport moving forward in under this banner. So it's I'm not here to criticize it. It's just more to sort of point out a few of the the things that I think are very much not gravel and. Uh, you know, instead of trying to define what is gravel, I think we can just point out that you know that doesn't seem very gravel to me because the the people actually committing their lives and their year and their season and their and their goals to gravel, I think uh, you know should be represented here. There we have it. Cheers, Nathan, for your time. Maybe by the time you're watching this video, you'll know how he got on at the world. Also, as always, join the conversation. Let us know what you think on the whole gravel scene on the worlds. Also, as always, clicky, clicky, likey, likey. You know what to do. And thanks for watching. Enjoy your riding.